So I'm Roger French, and I just turned on my video for a moment here. And then also in the room with us is uh, Dr. Jen Brave and, oh, well. and, and Ellen Curry. And then we have a large number of people on the call and other team members of the project also. And so our current, I'm going to mute, stop our video again just for the bandwidth. But the, uh, so this is a webinar that we're halfway through a project that we have a DOE CETO office project on performance and reliability of FERC modules and the impact of cell and packaging architectures for this. And this is a project with uh, Case Western Reserve University, University of Central Florida, University of Connecticut, DuPont, Cybrid, and Canadian Solar as team members. And uh, this is the project number that we're under. These are the participants right now and things like that. And what we'll be doing is reviewing through uh, the following topics. There was a Pareto survey that we mailed out and got some feedback on. We'll be overviewing the uh, status of FERC in the industry and various results from the project. And I believe that what we'll do is also uh, take questions uh, potentially sent through the chat box after each one of these sections or uh, at the end of the webinar. And so this we have that will be done uh, by in two hours, no more. And so I think that we can get started. And I think Jen Braid will talk first. It's actually Jen ah. Nicolas. Okay, so Jean Nicolas, and can you? Can you Okay. Yes, I can, I can you, uh, Roger. Can I have the? Can I change the slide myself? Can I have the hand for moving through the slides? You would have to share on your computer, so I think it'll be better if you just ask me when to go forward. Okay, sure. So, good morning, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Jean Nicolas Jobert, Reality and Performance Director at Kinden Solar. So, as we are very tight on on on, on, on schedule, I will start right away. I uh, first want to bring together two. Uh, two highlights, which are general trends in the industry, not directly related to PERC. First one, I think we can say we have changed the mode law. As you can see on this chart for our module average uh, price since the beginning of the PV industry, the recent uh, 10 years, I've seen a very a significant increase in the learning rate. And we are targeting in the next three years to increase the cumulative shipment and reach 800 gigawatts of installed PV capacity. Next slide. And before talking about the second trend, I put together a slide um, highlighting the main technology advancement for multicrystalline silicon technology in the last decade. Starting in the, from 2010, the industry introduced a large ingot size, the so-called generation six ingots, which was followed by high-performance multi-crystalline wafers. This change from, uh, since, uh, from 2015, there, there was a very rapid change in the wafer, wafer pro cutting process, and the industry, had, in less than two years, had completely phased out the slurry-based cutting wafer cutting process, replacing it by diamond wiring, royal sewing. This change, so they did evaluate. This change, in turn, allowed better texturing process, which are commonly referred as black silicone texturing. Here at Canyasola, we have been using metal catalyst chemical etching, MCC. And this was uh, followed by a strong push in mass production for PERC technology, which is the main topic of today's talk. Next, the point in blue is what we are targeting in the next year, from this year and next one which is an update ingot process based on cast mono technology, allowing mono efficiency at multi-cost. Next slide, please. So I can, and I can come to the second uh, uh, general trend I wanted to highlight. The PV industry, when it comes to technology, have been, uh, uh, have been always ahead of its own roadmap. In, my, in this slide here, you can see a graph taken out from the industry technology roadmap for PV, which shows that the PERC transition should take about 10 years to reach a full replacement of the current BSF back surface field technology. But, uh, next slide please. But the reality is completely different. 
This chart shows the actual evolution of the CSI multi-crystalline silicon technology. Within green, our previous uh, generation, back surface field cells, and in red, what we call P4, which is uh, our internal acronym for the PERC technology. So in less than one year and a half, we have been completely phasing out the PSF technology and replacing it by PERC. And by, by this end of this Q1, almost everything has been, uh, trans has been uh, shifted to PERC. In blue, it's again the monocast technology we're planning also to ramp up very aggressively in 2019 and 2012. Next slide, please. So uh, after highlighting these two generic trends, going back to the PERC technology itself. Next slide, please. So the PERC concept, passivated emitter real cell, was introduced in the, in the 80s by Martin Green and NSW, but has been reaching production only recently. The concept is basically the use of a national passivation layer on the rear side of the silicon to reduce the recombination loss, increasing VOC, and allow further reflection of the, of, of the additional photon towards the bulk, allowing increased ISC. To nowadays, uh, PERC cells have the, usually the following feature, features an improved texturing, from texturing process, MCC for Cadian Solar, an aluminum oxide based passivation layer on the rear side, uh, in terms of metallization, a five bird bar design, or recently we've seen also a very strong push for multi bus bar MBB design. That's a generic overview of the, of the PERC cell structure. In supplement of uh, improving significantly the, the wattage of the, of the module, PERC technology comes with uh, a significant upside on the performance side, allowing increased energy on the system, on, on system level. The PERC technology comes with an increased low light, better temperature coefficient, and a reduced module operating temperature. So allowing also great benefits on the system side. Next slide, please. Process-wise, it is an, an incremental technology which uh, allows us to retrofit quite quickly the production line. So it involves three additional process steps highlighted in blue on the right side, while the left side is an old, older BSF, a BSF process. The first additional step came after the rear side polishing and consists of a thermal oxidation followed by um, the deposition of a passivation layer usually now in the industry, oxy aluminum oxide, and finally a capping layer of si silicon nitride. The second step is a laser opening, a laser pattern opening many holes in the rear side of the cells, which allow us to do the metallization on the rear. The third important additional step is a, um, advanced, an annealing advanced regeneration process, which is here mainly to control LID and LTID mitigate the, these two non-failure modes. This process can, is usually done in two different ways. At Kenya Solar, we have been using cost-effective cost in-house current-induced regener regeneration process, but the industry has also been known to be using light-induced regeneration process. Next slide, please. Nowadays, we see in production average uh, by end of uh, 2018, Production of uh, efficiency of perks, multi multicrystalline perk cell was at about 20.5% and above, while monocrystalline perk were at 22.4%. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of uh, perks, the technology also offer another very interesting opportunity, which is it's enable very easily uh, transition to bifacial structure. So. You all have seen in the recent, in the two last year, most of the module manufacturer introducing bifacial product to the market. In, on the module side, the, technology, the, the bifacial module also come with uh, another incremental technology upgrade, which is the use of R cell technology, which for many of the products you know, will become soon, we expect a mainstream, uh, the new mainstream design. This has been due to the fact that perk cell uh, allow very high module wattage, 2060 watt for polycrystalline, 400 watt up to 400 watt for monocrystalline, and this high wattage creates more reliability risk 
for example, hotspot and so on. So there are felt technology all over at the same time to control efficiently the rarity risk. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, push three times. So uh, the transition to PERC is uh, next, Roger, please. The transition to PERC is not coming along. It's coming uh, with the transition to bifacial. So the usual PERC structure with a full aluminum cover on the back is a very short uh, product portfolio, I would say, and everything is already moving to a bifacial structure. Next, please. So by mid of 19 this year, at Canesola, we have moved all the cell production to bifacial perk. And we expect that many of our peers will be do, doing the same. This is due in part to the ease to introduce this, uh, thing, this change in production and some advantage we're say, seeing in bifacial perk technology, like better um, performance, uh, better LID and ETID performance, and of course, uh, enabling bifacial system design. Next slide, please. On this slide, I put together a short, uh, a brief overview of the cell efficiency roadmap for Canyon Solar, but it also applies very well to our peers for the next three years. By, two, by 2021, we expect to bring multicrystalline per cell efficiency to 23.1% and mono cell and mono perk to 23.6%. This will be done through incremental process improvement with a strong focus on wafer quality, ingots and wafer quality, increasing carrier lifetime, use of monocast process for multicrystalline, and also cell process improvement, incremental improvement on the passivation layer, electrical contact. And for the next percentage, we'll have to introduce new technology such as passivated contact, pascal, and super thin lines. Next, next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. It's on monocast. So, yes, sorry, it was a bit delayed on my side. Mm -hmm. For multicrystalline, a very important step would be the introduction of monocast technology. This is not a new concept. This was 40 years ago. This was already demonstrating, but it was Ground, mono like. Most of you may also remind of a quasi mono product to the market, but back then the percentage of mono wafers on the ingots were not, not high enough to allow a cost competitive product. But now, through the, through the introduction of breakthrough processing equipment, we, we have high expectation to reach very high percentage of mono break into uh, using uh, standard polycasting in both process. Next slide, please. The use of monocast ingots processing is going from our uh, first uh, deployment in our, in, our, in our ingot factory. We see an improvement by 1.3% in cell efficiency, which translates in an increase for a 60 cell module by about two power beads. Next slide, please. Another important aspect for bifacial perk cell technology is the uh, so-called bifacialty parameters, which play an important role in the, on, the, on the system side, as it's transferred directly to an increase in uh, energy yield. We are here before uh, talking about this roadmap, it is important to uh, is highlight in particularly uh, one point. When we design a bifacial cells, we don't want to compromise the cell front size efficiency uh, just to have a better bifacialty numbers. Because in the end, uh, the production due to the front size is still uh, more than 90% in actual system. So our, 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 our roadmap is somewhat conservative in terms of bifacial improvement. We expect that the cell bifacialty will improve from 70 5% by end of 2008, 2018, sorry, up to uh, 68 to 80% by the end of this year. This will be done through improvement in the reflectivity of the rear side, optimization of texturing, 
and optimization of the aluminum metallization used on the rear side. Next slide, please. Now I've quickly introduced what's going on the what's going on on the cell on the perk cell technology. I cannot avoid to speak about module technology. Along with the introduction of perk cells, there have been two main change, two main two main um, improvement on the module side. First, we seeing full cell being phased out quickly in the next years. The benefit of half cell design. Half cell design allow not only an improvement on the wattage by up to two power beams, but also come with um, several reliability advantage, like mitigating hot spot, allowing better resistance to shading, and so on. So currently, modular wattage with the current perk generation is about 360 watt to 365 watt for poly for multi grid selling and 365 to 400 watt for mono perk. Second important uh, transition in terms of module technology is about the wafer size. As we gain, as we invest more in our ingot and wafer R&D and gain better control on this process stage, we have opportunity to work on larger wafer size. And we are being, we at Canal Solar will have been, uh, will have uh, about two gigawatt of capacity for larger size wafer following modular wattage above 400 watt, which is here shown in, in the graph uh, under the name IQ product. So we see also this trend uh, happening. This is, I said, the most recent trend, which has been happening since starting from uh, last year, but is going to accelerate. And many of our peers are following the same path. Right, Roger, I think that's my, la my last slide. My last slide. Okay, so I'm Jen Braid here at Case Western, and I'm going to give you an overview of the project structure of our Perk Dagger program. So this is the summary slide from the DOE review. So um, the full title of the project is Reliability and Power Degradation Rates of Perk Modules Using Differentiated Packaging Strategies and Characterization Tools. So this project was funded through the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technology Office and under the PDRD2 program. And um, the collaborators are the team members who are presenting um, today. So the general idea of this project, and you can read through this entire slide uh, on your own time, but um, the idea is to be identifying the perk specific degradation modes. Um, so as perk cells gain in market share, as Jen and Gla just explained to us, um, they have some additional degradation concerns compared to traditional aluminum BSF cells. And those include possible susceptibility to light induced degradation and the stability or instability of the passivation layer on the rear side of the cell. So we'd like to measure this degradation, um, always benchmarking against aluminum BSF cells to understand the long-term performance of PERC cells and modules. So there are three main goals to this project. The first is to develop PERC specific module degradation pathway network models. Uh, and we do that by measuring the stressors, um, the mechanistic uh, responses, um, and building mathematical models to relate those uh, for full size and mini modules through accelerated and real world exposures. The second goal is to quantify interactions between PERC cells and module packaging strategies. And to do that, we're varying the packaging, including the encapsulant and back sheet in those mini modules and full size modules. And we're going to utilize novel characterization methods um, to identify those perk specific degradation modes. So to accomplish those goals, we have four main tasks. One is to test full size modules, 60 or 72 cells. Uh, we have mini modules that have four cells, which can be um, measured cell wise or as a full module. And then we have advanced module characterization um, specifically at UConn and UCF, which you'll get an overview of later. And we uh, perform large-scale data analytics 
through stepwise uh, accelerated exposures and on outdoor systems. So here are some of the variations of cell and packaging materials that we're using throughout the three years of this project. And you'll notice that some of these options haven't been defined for years two and three. And so part of the purpose of this webinar is to get feedback from research and industry members um, on what are the current commercially viable technologies that we should be um, testing in the last half of this project. And uh, this will also come from the results of the first half of this project, which is ending this quarter. Uh, the first half of the project is um, finishing this quarter. So uh, in the first year, we were strictly looking at monocrystalline perk cells, again, always benching again, benchmarking against aluminum BSF, full size cells, and then varying the encapsulate type between EVA and PoE and low, medium, and high uh, vapor transmission rate back sheets. In year two, uh, we're expanding to multicrystalline cells, full and half size cells, and looking at different variants of encapsulants, including white and UV cutoff behind the cell um, to either reflect light internally or protect the back sheet from UV degradation. So again, in year three, uh, using the results of this webinar, Pareto survey, and our first two years of testing, then we'll, we'll determine what to, to test moving forward. So we have real-world exposures of both mini modules and full-size modules. This is our sun farm at Case Western, and there are ongoing field tests at uh, Canadian Solar in Shuzhou, China. And with these, uh, not only do we get maximum PowerPoint tracking and inverter data type data, but we also get IV time series and corresponding irradiance and weather data um, so that we can uh, build SMR stress mechanism response models for that data. For accelerated tests, again, we can do mini modules and full size modules. And in, accelerating t in accelerated testing, what's important is that we do stepwise exposures and evaluations. So we don't just want to test a failure, but we want to identify the rates, shapes, trends, and mechanisms of degradation. So you'll get an overview of some of those evaluations later, uh, but here are some of the exposures that we do um, to induce different degradation modes, uh, including corrosion, cracking, and LID. So next we'll go to Chris to give us an overview of the results of the Pareto survey. Thanks, Jen. Uh, this is uh, Chris Davis. I'm an assistant professor of material science and engineering at UCF. And uh, thanks to everyone for filling out the, uh, the survey. I'm gonna go over the results now. If you can go to the next slide, please. So the, the first question was about, um, you know, risk for the individual cell and module components. And so a list was giving of, of some of the different components of the actual cells as well as, as the modules themselves. And it looked like in this case, the um, kind of the highest scores went towards the wafers. Uh, so I think, some people had some concerns about uh, light-induced degradation and lead ID, so it seems like those two were the, the primary ones that garnered the most uh, concern in terms of risk, um, with some of the other ones falling up in terms of passivation and, and the rear contact. Uh, next slide. So the, the next two questions were related to um, environmental and system stressors on the modules. And so the two-part question, one was on ALBSF, and one was on PERC to kind of gauge the differences between the two. Um, and so in this case, it looks like for ALBSF, um, you know, the mechanical loading issues, heat and humidity were kind of the two primary ones with uh, temperature swings and, and PID in terms of DC voltage also showing up. Um, and it looked relatively sim similar for PERC, but the, the main difference being that uh, the light and elevated temperature for PERC was, ended up being the, the major concern, which wasn't really much of a concern for ALBSF. And, and obviously, this must be related to people's concerns about lead ID, which we'll, we'll hear more about later in this presentation. Um, so that's on the environmental stressors. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So this question was looking at, um, in terms of cell technologies, um, you know, cell manufacturing, what needs to be improved the most to kind of ensure the continued adoption of PERC and ensure that we can continue to improve the efficiency, um, you know, as, as, as we'd like to do. So uh, in this case, the, the, the main limiting factor was the, the multi-wafers. That seems like the, the number one kind of um, technology that people think needs to be improved to continue to, to kind of allow PERC to be adopted in high volume manufacturing. Um, followed up by rear passivation and then mono wafers. Next slide. And so a similar question, but looking more at module manufacturing uh, in terms of what technologies need to be improved. And in this case, it looked like interconnects was the, the main one. So if we can improve the interconnect technology, people, people think that's the, the primary one to focus on in terms of uh, future R&D and, and development and manufacturing. All right. And then this question was geared at, you know, if, if within this project or within other projects, um, you know, if we're going to be doing various uh, reliability and durability studies, um, what kind of technologies would people like to see kind of compared and evaluated against each other? And so um, there were some examples of things that are different at the wafer and cell level and some that are different more at the module level and module materials level. Uh, so in this case, um, it appears that some of the cell level differences were the, the primary thing that people were interested in, particularly multi versus mono. I think uh, probably a lot of that, again, driven by some of these uh, degradation mechanisms, LID, LED ID, comparing those. The other one was uh, bifacial versus monofacial. I mean, I think all the interest in bifacial, people are just kind of curious, you know, are there going to be any potential reliability and durability studies? And so this is something we're actively working on the project. So that was that was reassuring to see that. Some of the others were um, interconnects also showed up as one, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense based on the kind of past history of, of PV module reliability and durability for ALBSF. And then also a uh, glass glass versus glass polymer. I think that that was another one that, that seemed to have some interest. All right, next slide. And uh, so this question um, was focused on, you know, where should we kind of put some of our future R&D effort in terms of PERC reliability and durability. Uh, so if, again, if we want to ensure that PERC modules continue to be produced with high reliability, high durability, what kind of areas should we be kind of allocating a lot of effort? And it looks like um, ensuring, you know, that we have the right materials and manufacturing processes to make the module durable was one of the top ones, as well as having character, characterization techniques to kind of um, better measure and understand the quality of those materials and, and diagnose potential problems. But it looked like in general for all, all five of these, there was, um, you know, pretty high interest across the board. Um, so, so in this case, the, you know, there was, there was a lot of interest in all five of these different areas. All right. And then um, I guess in terms of also I asked people to list additional areas of concern. So I think I've mentioned a few of those. There was some, in terms of PERC module reliability and durability, uh, some of the things that people brought up were, um, you know, they'd like to see better characterization in terms of actual energy yield in the field instead of just focusing on standard test conditions. So looking at things like low light level performance uh, related to shunting effects, uh, things like, um, you know, spectral effects, operating at a higher temperature. So that was one. Another was uh, related to one of the options, uh, development of meaningful accelerated test methods to predict failure mechanisms. So kind of improving those accelerated testing techniques. Also the reliability of transparent back sheet materials for bifacial modules. So if we're shifting from glass, glass to glass transparent polymer, what's the reliability of that? Um, and then questions that people would like to see addressed in future webinars. One was, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, purchasers of PV modules, what are the top uh, several items to look for when they're kind of comparing different PERC modules, you know, against one another in terms of trying to reduce risk associated with degradation? And the other question was, why do we continue to use DAMP as a way to predict field degradation when the field results do not support this position? So I think people have some concerns that maybe the DAMP test doesn't best reflect um, what's actually going on in the field. And so that, that's another question that, that someone brought up. Um, so thanks again for everyone that participated. Uh, really appreciate that. And, and I'll, I'll send it, I can send an email with these kind of results to, to all the respondents 
Um, thank you. All right. And so moving to the next section, um, here I'll be talking about uh, some work that, that we've been doing uh, with the rest of the project team members focused on characterization of monofacial and bifacial perk cells. Next slide. So, um, you know, just taking a step back, when we think about a solar cell, there's kind of three different steps that go on to convert light into electricity. Um, so first we have to get photons inside the semiconductor absorber and generate the excess carriers. So if we don't do a good job of that, we have high optical losses. So obviously we want to minimize optical losses and we want to have characterization techniques that can best kind of capture that specific loss mechanism. So step two, once the carriers have been generated, they need to make it to the electrical contacts before they actually recombine. And that's a really important one as you push to higher and higher cell efficiencies, that one becomes more and more important. So again, we want to avoid these recombination losses, particularly through shockley reed hall recombination. We want to minimize that, and we want to have the characterization techniques to accurately measure that and understand where that's going on and, and how much it's influencing the cell performance. And then the last one is we, um, the charge carriers need to be delivered to the external circuit. So we have some resistive losses going on, you know, within the bulk, but also more importantly at the actual electrical contacts themselves and then throughout the kind of cell metallization and the interconnects and everything through the, the module circuit. So those resistive losses, again, they need to be minimized and we want to have ways to measure them. This is important not only from a manufacturing and R&D perspective, uh, when we're actually developing, you know, new cells and modules, but also from a durability perspective, if, if there is a problem in terms of the, the module performance over time, we want to be able to trace down and determine, like, which one of these loss mechanisms um, is, is responsible for that, and then that will help us, help, help get us one step closer to what's the root cause of that loss. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, loss mechanisms, um, you know, you can, you can create a simple equivalent circuit for a solar cell where you have kind of a, a current source uh, with, with the diode that represents, uh, you know, where kind of some of the recombination is occurring. And then you have these parasitic resistance losses. You have shunting, uh, you know, which is, is uh, you know, often a quality control issue that you, you try and just kind of avoid that to, as much as you can because it can be very detrimental. And then you have the series resistance as well, which it's going to be some finite value and it's all about kind of optimizing everything within the, the cell and module to minimize it as much as you can. And if you think about uh, uh, an eliminated IV or JV curve, current voltage uh, curve, um, there's the, the different loss mechanisms affect different parts of the, the IV or JV curve. So the optical losses primarily influence kind of the short circuit current. So they'll lower the kind of the current in this uh, photo, -rated, photo generated current source here within the equivalent circuit. And then we have the resistive losses, which influence the, uh, the fill factor, not so much the short circuit or open circuit performance. And then you have the recombination losses, which in some ways, again, are, are, are the most critical for these really high efficiency cells. And so that, that can influence, um, you know, the VOC, the JSC, and the fill factor, it especially is sensitive to the open circuit voltage, but it also influences the other areas. Um, so moving to the next slide, please. So in terms of, uh, there's different recombination mechanisms that can, con that can occur within a device. Um, and so we want to kind of keep track of those and, and, and understand where the recombination is taking place. So we, we've, we have radiative recombination. In the case of silic silicon, it's indirect band gaps. So that radiative recombination lifetime is, is very long. It's a pretty inefficient process. Um, and that's kind of an intrinsic uh, property of silicon itself. We have Auger recombination which is also kind of an intrinsic factor, but you have a little control of that in terms of uh, controlling the doping level within the bulk wafer and within the doped re the heavily doped regions, uh, as well as like the actual uh, injection level at which the device is operating. Um, but then the more interesting types of recombination me mechanisms are the shockley reed hall recombination. So that can be due to bulk defect states within the actual uh, substrate itself within the absorber. So that could be due to uh, metal impurities that act as a deep level defect, as well as things like crystallographic uh, defects. So things like grain boundaries and stuff like that can, can add recombination. And then we have um, recombination due to surface defect states. So we have interface traps uh, due to the dangling bonds at the surface. So those need to be passivated. And if you think about the kind of the overall effective carrier lifetime of the entire device, 
it's, you can represent it in terms of the inverse sum of all these different components. Where in parentheses, we have what's affecting the bulk, the radiative age, and the bulk shock and read hall recombination. And we can kind of separate that from the front and rear surface recombination. So next slide. So we think about an ALBSF versus a PERC cell. Um, why is the efficiency higher? Well, one is we get better light trapping, of course, because we have a dielectric on the rear, so we get better internal rear reflectance, so that helps with some of the optical losses. But the, probably the bigger driving factor is the fact that we replace this full area metal contact, which has relatively high recombination uh, with just a small local contact, still has high recombination, but this aluminum oxide passivated interface has very, very low recombination. So it brings, it brings down the overall recombination happening at the rear surface. So it's, it's a uh, very effective mechanism to kind of increase the VOC of the, the, the solar cell. Next slide. So in this project, uh, what we're trying to do is in addition to um, some of the traditional characterization methods used for modules, uh, you know, illuminated IV at STC and EL imaging, we're also looking at uh, doing sun's VOC measurements, which a lot of groups, uh, you know, Sinton Instruments and other people have demonstrated can be very effective for characterizing modules. So we're using that technique as well as uh, photoluminescence imaging to kind of complement some of the EL imaging uh, and also uh, external quantum efficiency and reflectance mapping. So doing spatially resolved EQE and reflectance. Uh, so we're doing this, we're starting to do this now in some, some mini modules and stuff like that through these reliability part of the project. We don't have any of the results to present on the actual modules, but we are gonna share some results of these types of characterization methods on some different unencapsulated cells. And so the focus of what I'm showing here, if you can go back for one second, if you, the, is decoupling optical and recombination losses using the imaging and mapping techniques to not only quantify spatial uniformity, but also identify potential manufacturing defects and get to their root cause and then again, use these techniques for mini modules. So next slide, um, for the PL imaging, we basically have a, a laser excitation, 808 nanometers that you can see on the far right. Um, so it, it shines on the, the, the solar cell or the mini module, which is what we're doing now. Um, we have an optical filter, removes the 808 light, the camera picks up the radiative recombination. Um, and so, you know, the longer wavelength light emitted from the device is the radiative recombination. And the bright regions have less non-radiative recombination, which is good, so bright is good. Dark regions have more non-radiative recombination, so they're bad. So you can look at, here's an image of, a, of an industrial kind of six-inch uh, multi-crystalline ALBSF cell. You can see the open circuit PL image. Another thing you can do if you do a VOC measurement with that, you can convert that to a VOC, VOC image, and it can be useful to understand kind of the, the performance of the cell. And if you see certain patterns in certain um, characteristics of the image, you can kind of trace it back to things that could have gone wrong in manufacturing. So next, next slide. So some of you may be familiar with that. Um, so a more, more interesting technique as well as uh, doing quantum efficiency and reflectance mapping. So we have a system from Tau Science, a flash QE system that's been, um, we've, we've combined an integrating sphere with this system to allow us to do EQE and reflectance at the same time. So you can see kind of a picture of the system with the, the spot there. So we can basically raster along the surface of the cell and this flash QE can do the QE and the reflectance in, in like a second. Um, and so we can create these kind of images of quantum efficiency and do a, various types of analysis on this. So number one, we can just integrate the entire EQE curve and we can get to images of JSC that's like what you see on the bottom left, but we can also separate individual loss mechanisms. Uh, so these different parts of the curve, we have the short wavelength region so we look at the um, kind of what's lost in the EQE in terms of, um, you know, recombination and parasitic absorption within the anti-reflection coating in the emitter. Uh, we also have the front surface reflectance that we pick up with the integrating sphere on the short wavelengths. And if we go on the other side to the long wavelengths, we have the escape reflectance that we can pick up. Um, so that's light that's gone through the semiconductor and it's been internally reflected and then comes back out, leaks back out the front. So we can kind of pick that up and quantify it. And then we have all of the uh, kind of recombination and parasitic absorption due to the bulk in the rear. So that's any carriers that kind of recombine in the bulk or at the rear surface or any of the light that's been absorbed within the, the rear metal and the uh, aluminum and, and the aluminum silicon eutectic. So we can get images of the loss in the emitter and loss in the bulk, for example, and you can look at dark regions within the JSC and see, all right, well, what do these do to? So the one in the center, there's kind of a big dark blob. You can see, well, that's due to bulk 
recombination and parasitic absorption, not due to something in the emitter. So that can be very useful. So next slide. So for this comparison, we looked at a, ver a variety of different cells, uh, multi-ALBSF, mono-ALBSF. We also looked at uh, two different types of mono crystalline perk cells. We looked at the, the more traditional monofacial as well as the kind of emerging bifacial. Um, and what was interesting is, is uh, the monofacial and bifacial, two of the groups of cells that we looked at came from the same manufacturer. So you see they have very similar performance. It's just that the, the bifacial cell can obviously be integrated into you know, glass glass or glass transparent modules to kind of pick up light from the rear side. So next slide. So in terms of the JSC and VOC, as we expect uh, going from ALBSF to PERC, we get a pretty big boost uh, in the JSC and in the VOC. So a lot of that JSC increase is again due to improved rear optics as well as the lower rear surface recombination. And in the, the VOC case, it's really driven by that reduction in the uh, rear surface recombination by adding that rear passivation layer. So in general, we see a pretty big increase here. And then within each of these, between mono and multi, obviously the mono does a little bit better, um, uh, you know, especially on the JSC side. And then uh, for the for the PERC, we see kind of similar performance with the Gen 1 and Gen 2 uh, that came from the same supplier. Uh, and the, the, the PERC Gen 0 came from a different supplier. They obviously don't have quite as efficient of a process. Um, so in this case, we didn't consider any kind of rear side illuminations, which is why these last two perform very close to each other. So next slide. So we also doing some of the Sun's VOC analysis. You can take a look at things like the effective carrier lifetime. So this is the, uh, the carrier lifetime at the uh, max power voltage uh, in terms of the implied, the, the implied IV curve. Um, so here you can see, as we'd expect for the PERC, we get a higher effective carrier lifetime. Again, we're reducing the rear surface recombination. Um, and so amongst, between mono and multi-crystalline ALBSF, we see a little bit of a boost uh, in the mono. And then for the PERC, we see, again, higher all across the board. We also see more variability. And uh, I think the, the case here is essentially what happens is in the case of the ALBSF, the rear surface is kind of the limiting factor in terms of recombination. Um, and it's pretty consistent from you know, sample to sample. Whereas in the case of the PERC, you start to become limited by the, the bulk wafer quality, and that can be a bit more variable in terms of, you know, just the crystal growth process and everything like that. Um, so you can see more variance here in terms of the effective carrier lifetime. Uh, so next slide. So uh, you can also compare things like the PL images across these different cell types, and some of the things that emerge, if you look at just generally the ALBSF uh, versus the PERC, the PERC is brighter, that makes sense. It has a higher open circuit vol voltage, uh, higher excess carrier density, and so, you know, more radiative recombination uh, because of less non-radiative recombination. Uh, between the mono ALBSF and the multi-crystalline ALBSF, you can see the, the case of the multi, you get the grain boundaries and all the kind of features that show up due to that, whereas the mono looks a little more uniform. Um, the mono ALBSF and the mono PERC Gen, Gen 0 that you see here, those came from the same supplier and kind of the, they have the both of them have the four bus bars. So you can see the the brightening, everything is pretty much similar in these two, except the fact that the, uh, the, the PERC has that rear surface passivation, and you see it becomes a little bit brighter. Uh, the Gen 1 and Gen 2 look uh, very similar. Again, they came from the same supplier. It's just one is monofacial, one's bifacial. Uh, next slide. So what we can do with some of the PL is we can compare it with things like the EL imaging, which is very common to do for, for modules and stuff like that. And we can start to pick up interesting types of defects and stuff like that. So PL really just captures the recombination issues uh, it, when we're doing open circuit PL. So we're doing it open circuit so it doesn't capture any of the resistive losses, whereas EL captures both recombination and resistive losses. So what you can do is you can kind of compare the two and uh, the dark regions that show up in EL but not in PL, we can trace those back to resistive defects, whereas the things that show up dark in both are more likely recombination issues. So you can see here in red we have this uh, these discontinuities and the front contact metallization that show up in the EL but don't show up in the PL. Um, so that's one example of how we're going to use this moving forward in some of the mini module studies uh, and stuff like that. So next slide. And so we're also going to try and use this EQE and reflectance mapping in some of these studies. Here's an example on uh, one of the one of the PERC cells uh, where we saw this uh, kind of a minor defect, but it was it was kind of interesting. So we noticed this in the open circuit PL. 
if you look at where the, the red regions, it's like slightly dark, kind of near the top here. And so we immediately started doing some EQE and reflectance mapping. And you can see it also affects the short circuit current density. So we wanted to know, well, so what does this do to? Why, why is this happening? So we can do this mapping and we can look at losses in the emitter. We don't really see that pattern. Uh, we look at the reflectance images. We don't see that pattern. But if you look at the kind of the bulk and rear, which is that long wavelength kind of IQE part of the curve, the internal quantum efficiency part, we can see it does show up there. So we can trace that back to something either in the, the bulk or at the rear surface. Likely it's some issue with the rear surface, maybe a surface preparation or a film deposition issue during passivation. Um, and so the combination of all the IB, Sun's VOC, PL, along with this EQ reflectance mapping can again help us understand the type of losses that are occurring and where they're occurring. And so our hope is to use this and basically identify regions within degraded uh, mini modules and, and modules and basically hand it off to people doing, you know, materials characterization studies. And that's kind of a segue into the next part of the, the uh, presentation, which is going to be from UConn, where they're doing some fascinating stuff on nanoscale characterization of, of perk cells. Okay, thank you. So this is Brian Huey at the University of Connecticut, and this aspect of, of the project and of the presentation today is um, the most, um, most I guess, furthest down on the technical readiness level uh, because we're developing new methods to measure um, PV properties and, and performance metrics, and especially to map them uh, down at the nanoscale where, where we expect properties to uh, and, and um, degradation effects to, to come into play. Okay, so next slide. So we are using an atomic force microscope to make the measurements. Uh, but as, as a little bit of background first, we are looking at um, a variety of PERC cells as part of this project and, and be it standard ALBSF cells. Um, we're going to be working in a, in a specimen configuration where we're looking at um, a cross-section sample and you can see some SEM and, and in the lower right optical cross-sections. But in particular, we're working with samples that have been um, shallow angle polished. And so if you go to the next, um, yeah, the next animation, um, that will allow us to look into the depth of the specimen, but over a, a relatively large range. And so the montage of optical images at upper right um, is really showing you what, what the backside of one of these um, PERC cells looks like. That's a PERC Gen 1 cell that you see there, where the, the um, local vias, the local BSFs are essentially linear. They're on something like a one millimeter uh, spacing. And the local BSF itself that you could see in the, in the lower left cross section, the SEM, um, each of it, those are essentially linear um, along the center of the dark lines and the optical images at upper right. Now, one of the things that we see and that others have noted in the past is that upon um, polishing or, or even uh, fracturing to, to open up a, a cross section, um, there is there there is compressive stress that exists within those structures because of the way they're processed. Um, at least in this case, and and I think in most cases, right? You have a um, a, a laser system that's essentially locally melting and then um, driving aluminum into the specimen. And so you end up with this um, 30 to 60 micron deep um, hemispherical structure, or in this case, a linear uh, uh, half cylinder, essentially. Um, and so, so within that structure, you have uh, driven aluminum strongly into the, to the silicon. Uh, and all around it then is uh, a highly doped aluminum region, which of course, um, helps with carrier um, collection. So we're going to study especially that interface, that local BSF uh, on those structures. And so in that um, shallow angle cross section at upper right, we've exposed uh, one, two, three, four, five different dark lines at the center one of each one of those is one of these um, something like 60 micron across um, hemispherical structures. Okay, so next slide. Let me tell you a little bit about what we can do with that. So we're going to drop an atomic force microscope probe down on the surface. Now, an atomic force microscope, of course, is a method for tracking the topography of a surface, but we especially, and that's how most of those systems are used um, to look at surface morphologies. Um, we and others, uh, especially in the PV community, take advantage of the fact that that probe can be conducting. Uh, and so we will use it essentially as a positionable local electrode. Uh, so, so that's serving as the back electrode then uh, for this cell that essentially we've turned upside down. 
we then mount it, that whole system, on top of, of an optical path that allows us to um, illuminate the specimen from below. Um, so again, in, in an upside down configuration from how these are mounted for the sun, uh, but uh, physically upside down, but practically it's, it's operating in exactly the same way. The only difference is instead of that aluminum back electrode, the AFM probe is serving as a local uh, positionable back electrode because we can scan it with nanoscale fidelity. So we're going to look at areas on the order of a couple of micrometers on a side with resolution down to tens of nanometers, which is correlated to um, the, the contact area between the tip and the specimen. Um, so, so that's why this, this work is, is the most um, perspective of, of the different things that we're hearing because this is extending the length scales over which we can do PV mapping um, from literally square meters, right, or even kilometers for, for, uh, for our project partners who are, who are um, uh, installing proper um, solar cell installations down to uh, the micro scale with some of the results you just heard about, um, and then in this case down into the nano scale. So we are especially interested in things like um, the short circuit current and the VOC. And there are many in the community, in the AFM and, and nanoscale community, who have looked at photovoltaics in a variety of different ways, especially for, for nanostructured systems. Um, but for, for high volume systems like, like uh, BSF and, and PERC systems, um, the typical way we might make such a measurement is to do IV mapping at select positions, or maybe maps of, of the IV response in general. Uh, that are spatially resolved again at the nanoscale. So we and others have done that. You can also make measurements of the surface potential uh, as a function of light. Um, we can control things like the intensity or the wavelength that we're exposing the specimen to, to of course look for those um, specific effects. But something new that we have developed and we felt was worth sharing with this community um, online is um, a new method to directly measure VOC. And so really what we're doing is hacking into our atomic force microscope, but this is something that, that others can extend this as well. Um, and, and we're making effectively the same measurement that the community makes at, at the centimeter or, or square meter scale, um, whereby um, upon illumination, we measure the voltage at which the um, photo elimination current drops to zero. Right, so that, that red spot at VOC. So we are, are essentially just running a feedback system that'll allow us to do that um, in real time while we scan. Now real time in the atomic force microscope, microscope community is still a little bit slow compared to some of the other measurements you're hearing, but, but we'll make our measurements in, um, in five to 10 minutes on that order. Okay, so that allows us to map VOC locally. And now in this next slide, uh, again, we have, um, a top-down view of the back side of a solar cell where we have the perk lines uh, which generate local vias and we're especially going to home in on that little blue box which is um, a corner of, of one of those vias um, where it um, uh, runs up against the the polycrystalline aluminum back electrode so next advance so here's some examples of some of the kinds of results that we see. Uh, these are some of the very earliest measurements that we made. So on the, on the right side of each of these uh, images, uh, C and E are at, at one location and D and F are at a, at a similar location for a different via. Um, the bottom two images, the red to yellow, is, is showing the topography. And essentially what's happening here is in the, in the um, silicon uh, single crystal silicon, or at least single crystal within the field of view. Um, the surface is, is astonishingly smooth, essentially almost uh, atomically smooth. But then there's all kinds of craziness going on at the top of each of those images and on their right side. So at the top, that's where we are um, jutting into protruding aluminum particles from the aluminum paste back electrode. And on the right is is just into the corner of the local BSF where the aluminum has been driven in. Um, and you really, really have a polysilicide there um, because of the recrystallization that happens after the local melt um, during, during the processing. And that then, uh, because it's a polysilicide, the, because it has different orientations than the bulk silicon, because it's aluminum doped, um, all of those things mean it polishes a little bit preferentially. So we end up with holes over there of varying depths, depending on the local crystal that's, that's in our field of view. The point is that if I then compare that to the short circuit current map in the upper left, C, or open circuit potential map in the upper right um, that, that we've directly measured in, using our new approach, um, we can see that there's, there's contrast that has nothing to do with the topography. Uh, we certainly have some topographic effects as well, the bright orange bands that appear. But uh, 
there's this feature that seems to extend um, one to two microns into the bulk silicon, and that's um, uh, that is aligned with what we would expect to happen for the aluminum uh, being driven into the to the bulk. If I can go to the next slide, please, I'll give you a much clearer picture of this concept um, and, and more recent data, where now we're showing at the bottom a montage of 25 images in a, in a, a very careful analysis um, that we performed around an entire um, perk via. Um, and so again, topographically, the surface in the bulk silicon is very smooth, but then around it, um, when, we, when we dip into the polysilicide, um, that area polishes prefer preferentially, so we get a hole. So that's that's a good topographic marker for where the edge of that region is. In the VOC, we have an even stronger marker uh, for where the where we're within the direct via versus into the doped local BSF. Um, and so that's that green band that extends, um, as you see, uh, somewhere between one and a few and up to five microns into the specimen. Um, and and that depth is uh, not uniform. Um, which is an indicator that, um, you know, of course, the, the diffusion profile uh, will depend on local orientations and local position, um, and, and in any case, the local thermal, the thermal history during that processing event. And so it isn't quite as uniform as, as we would all maybe like to imagine, uh, but at the same time, it, it is only ranging over a couple of microns. Um, finally, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So... No, that's fine, one more. So it is conventionally the case that we can acquire stacks of images in a single area and map out short circuit current or open circuit potential uh, or Pmax or, or do a SUNS VOC analog uh, to some of the results you were hearing about a moment before. Maybe you can advance so that the, the bullets show up. Thanks. Um, but what we're, we're really trying to do is, is share the fact that VOC can even be considered down at this nanoscale, um, that we can correlate it with short circuit data, uh, short circuit current data, um, and, and Pmax and other, other indicators of, of solar cell performance. But we can make those measurements then at very fine scales where we would expect things like degradation pathways uh, to begin to indicate uh, ver to changes. Uh, so we're hoping that, first of all, um, in next generation measurements that we'll be reporting with, out to you uh, the next time we talk, um, we would expect to be able to compare our results very directly with the more macro scale measurements or even micro scale measurements that you've heard about earlier. Um, but also we're, we're hoping to use this kind of scheme in two ways. One is to identify, um, more, well, to provide us more information about fundamental pathways of degra degradation down at this nano scale where they'll, they'll be beginning. And, and then the other is um, possibly that this mech, that this, experimental approach will allow us to have early indicators for degradation. Of course, it's a destructive method, um, so, so it would only be applicable for, for occasional samples, um, but the, the possibility of being able to identify um, degradation and degradation pathways at certain locations and identify which those, lo which preferred, locations, um, which those preferred locations might be um, is a very powerful capability for whether it's for PERC or other method or other solar cell uh, devices as well. Okay, so with that, I will hand off the presentation to our next um, speaker and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how all of these kinds of measurements relate to um, degradation and especially warranties in, in a little while. Thank you. So this is Moho from Case Western. So in the past hour or so, we have been mostly looking at the cell. However, there's another Im important factor in terms of the lifetime of a solar module, and that is the polymer components, or in other words, the encapsulin and back sheets. So researchers in the past have been mostly using standalone films to do the exposures. Um, uh, although it, it may not be the most realistic representation of a solar module, um, it is much easier to measure. So uh, that's one of the important reasons we used to use that. However, in our project, we're trying to put the different encapsulant and backsheet in the whole system so we can uh, see how the encapsulant and backsheet and uh, uh, including the cells, how well they perform together. So um, we are adopting a, a different structure of sample that we will refer to as coupons. And that includes a, uh, a piece of glass, two layers of encapsulant and, and backsheet. So we have a more uh, realistic uh, uh, representation of the solar module. And all the materials are provided by separate materials. 
So um, we have two choices of encapsulant over here, which is the ethylene vinyl acetate or EVA that we are really familiar with. And also we have the more uh, a newer candidate, which is the polyolefin elastomer or PoE. So the, uh, the main or uh, let's say the only difference between the two encapsulants is the back, uh, the sides group of the two different encapsulants. So they share the similar, uh, they, they share the same polyethylene backbone. And well, EVA has an SDA side group, the PoE has a um, alkyl side group, which is nonpolar. And the pol polarity of the different encapsulant decides the, all the other uh, features of the different uh, encapsulants. So the EVA is easier to crosslink compared to PoE and it has a, sh a longer shelf life. However, it does pr uh, produce the acidic acid and other uh, different degradation products that MOE, uh, PoE may or may not produce. And uh, PoE also tr uh, has much lower water vapor transmission rate and therefore uh, is anti-PID. So, Here's the uh, whole structure of the coupon. We have the solar lamp glass, uh, the encapsulant, uh, the transparent and UV cutoff encapsulant, and the back sheet. Um, we have three different back sheets uh, using this project so far, uh, including the uh, low to high water vapor transmission rate uh, back sheet. Um, although they have different water transmission rate, they, they are not, uh, the difference is not only just the water vapor transmission rate. The, they all have PD as the color um, of the back sheet, and two on the left have PVDF at the air layer or the outermost layer, and uh, one on the red has PTS outer layer. So on the left, we have a picture of the coupons that we have been exposing. So we have completed 4,000 hours of uh, stepwise stampede exposure, and one coupon is retained uh, after every exposure step. And in between each ex ex exposure steps, they have been measured with uh, different non-destructive measurements, including FDR and uh, Raman, but uh, we are going to discuss that later. So uh, here's some interesting results that we have discovered after the stampede exposure. So as I mentioned, uh, two of the back sheet has PVDF as outermost layer, and as they all started from pure alpha phase, beta phase has been emerging uh, during the damp heat exposure. So we can see the beta, uh, the beta peaks are uh, emerging over here. And here's just a little bit background of the phase of, back uh, of PVDF. So PVDF basically have five different microphases and the alpha phase is a uh, trans gauge confirmation and beta is an all trans confirmation. And if we calculate the relative beta fraction with this equation over here, we can see that one of the encapsulant back sheet combination, which is the PoE with the KPX back sheet, has the highest beta ratio. So if we go back here to the uh, chain confirmation here, we can see that beta has a more uh, longer end-to-end -end distance and the beta phase is usually uh, induced by e either stretching or uh, pulling, so aligning the chain of the PVDF. So I'll Obviously, in damp heat exposure, there's no external force uh, applied onto the coupon. So this kind of phase transformation is induced by the internal stress inside the coupon. And uh, why is there internal? Uh, we know there could be internal stress, but uh, 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 obviously there's a difference in terms of the encapsulants that induce the stress. So. With that, we are recently adopting the micro-indentation onto the, this layer structure, so hopefully you can be able to uh, capture the different mechanical responses of both the back sheet and the encapsulant. So uh, this is what we uh, tried so far. Uh, we did uh, over 500 uh, microns uh, of uh, depth. However, um, if we zoom in into this region over here, which is only up to 80 microns, we can see there's a, a clear change point uh, at around 55 microns. And um, we, we can assume that, that this fourth section of this micro indentation is reflecting the behavior of the back sheet. And you can see the unloading portions um, shows a elastic plus plastic response. However, if we get uh, after this portion section over here, we can see this response is mainly just purely elastic. That means we are getting to the rubbery encapsulant. So uh, uh, we are trying out different uh, non-destructive measurements uh, uh, and we'll 
we keep doing that in our project and we are also going to incorporate more uh, encapsulated and backsheet combinations uh, along with more uh, exposures. So with that, I'll um, hand over to our next presenter, which is the overview of module warranties. Okay, so we went from a very exploratory approach uh, that I told you about making nanoscale measurements to now, if you can go to the next slide, to now um, look at a much grander scale. And this actually followed some recommendations that came to us from DOE um, that we try to put the work a little bit more into context. Uh, we like this idea. And, and given that our objective uh, is really to understand better mechanisms for degradation um, in, in per, compared to, to ALBSF systems, um, and then also to just to advance the science of, of degradation studies in general. Um, obviously, an important outcome of all of that is that we will influence um, the community and, and really the, the business of solar cells by trying to hopefully um, have a better marker for a better understanding of what causes degradation, a better appreciation for actual lifetimes, and also the sort of the statistical error in that. Um, so that better projections can be made and that ultimately should correlate to things like price and warranties. So this is a summary of an analysis of warranties up until the, I think the third quarter of 2018, um, where we have categorized um, standard warranty terms from the various commercial vendors where we can collect them um, for BSF systems, both polycrystalline mono and monocrystalline, um, for double glass, poly and mono BSF, for PERC, um, and then also for double PERC. Um, we don't have polycrystalline PERC data yet. Uh, and so this is just a table that summarizes all of it, and especially on the far right is the number of warranties that we were able to assemble. Uh, certainly there are more, but, but that's where um, our early attempts have led us. There's another category called other down near the bottom, um, and that is really bundling uh, a few warranties that we collected for very different styles or, or technologies of solar cells. Um, and so I won't talk about that any further because th those technologies are sufficiently different that, that I think it's just really out of context. Um, and then we have some overall average data just to, um, to put things into perspective. So on the next slide, I want to just graph a few of the pertinent details here. Um, so first of all, if we look at the warranty duration, uh, which is of course our simplest indicator of, of what industry expects uh, in terms of overall lifetime of the device, uh, so the overall performance, um, and then the, the workmanship uh, warranties. And so there's, there's you know, almost a uniform 10-year um, and 25-year warranty. Um, double glass has usually um, a 30-year um, warranty instead of 25, um, recognizing the, the longer lifetime that is expected for that technology. Um, and from this point further, what we'll do, and actually what's embedded in the, in the table even, um, is we'll compare things like mean performance, whether it's an annual performance metric or just the overall performance, only out to 25 years. So there, I want to just identify this fact that double glass technologies um, are expected to provide another five years of warranty. Uh, warranted service, but we're just to, to put things on a level playing field, we'll only look at the first 25 years. Okay, next. All right, we're first thinking about the data in terms of that mean warranted performance. So um, all of these performance metrics that I'm showing you in the table and, and in these, these plots or these bar graphs um, is with respect to new efficiency and, and new um, kilowatt hours, essentially. Um, so we have not looked at the specific values, frankly, because the specific um, efficiencies um, are a little bit difficult to ascertain um, and depend, depend on a lot of other factors. So everything is with respect to a new device from any given manufacturer. Okay, next. Uh, we will also look at the data in a slightly different way. Instead of the overall performance in the terms of, of performance over one and 25 years, uh, we'll think about the degradation rate, right? And so um, that's either over one year or just the average response over, over many years. And that helps us, uh, frankly, just to compare things on a, on a single scale. Um, so there are a few observations here that are probably not surprising, but okay, for, for um, devices, they generally have a 25-year um, performance metric. Um, 
and that's relatively uniform. Um, the performance is after one year is looks pretty similar for most of the devices, um, and and that's the same. The same is true um, in terms of degradation, um, because there's not a lot that changes over over that first year. Um, over the lifetime of the device, though, with the caveat that some of those the, the double glass technologies have a, have an extra five years. Um, we definitely have a slightly lower performance for MonoPerk than BSF. Um, and uh, if you can go to one more bullet, um, our our assessment is that that's because this is a new technology, and so there's a slight discount in in expectations uh, for MonoPerk versus the much more established user base for BSF. Um, and so that's something that one would expect to improve over time. Um, but this all leads us to one really important um, observation, and that is that warranties are are a proxy for understanding how the industry is um, is understanding their lifetime of their products and uh, and and the the scatter in that lifetime. However, it also includes marketing, and so um, the fact that uh, many of these devices are warranted for you know ten years uh, for for um, for manufacturing essentially, and and twenty five years for performance. Um, that, that feels a little bit like when we buy a car and we simply expect a five-year warranty and, and 60,000 miles. Um, so, so any variations in um, understood lifetimes and degradation um, that, in, that exist for one particular manufacturer or another and, and for, for um, a certain technology, I think those are built into, mo most likely those are built into cost as opposed to the warranty terms, um, but for the obvious extension of five years for double glass. Um, okay, so so this is this is something that we will continue to monitor because again, our ultimate objective is to influence um, influence the industry uh, with the, our better understanding of degradation pathways. Um, and with that, I will pass the pass the conch back to uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Brian. So my name is Eric Schneller. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Central Florida. And, uh, and what I'd like to talk about is really what we know about degradation modes and mechanisms for PV devices <clears throat> and PV modules. And I'd like to highlight the challenges that we may expect uh, that are specific to PERC technologies. So, when I think about module failure modes, I like to break them into sort of two categories. The first being what I call module failure modes. And this is things associated with the interconnection scheme or the module packaging materials themselves. Uh, and includes things like encapsulant discoloration or, or delamination, whether that's uh, at the rear surface due to the back sheet or delamination at the, the front side of the device between the encapsulant in the cell or, or any interface there. Uh, issues with, with back sheet deterioration, whether that's cracking or yellowing. And then issues related to interconnects, interconnect breakage due to thermal cycling or solder bond degradation. And then finally, any issues with the, the junction box uh, and, and bypass diodes. The, the second category, if you can go to the next slide, is really cell failure mode. And so these are things related to the PV device itself um, and includes a number of different issues, <clears throat> cell fracture, metallization, corrosion, uh, potential induced degradation or, or some, uh, LETID or light induced degradation, potentially even some ARC corrosion or degradation. And so I think when we think about PERC technologies, we're really more interested in what's going on at the cell level. I think a lot of the, the module packaging, the interconnection strategies are, are very similar across all silicon technologies. So what we really want to focus in on are these cell failure modes. And if you can go to the next slide, these are the, the failure modes that, that may have some new considerations that we want to uh, address related specifically to PERC technologies. And so this is, uh, these are the things I'll, I'll talk about as we move forward. So the, the next, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. The, the first one I wanna talk about is metallization corrosion. Um, and this is a known failure mode that occurs after extended damp heat for screen printed silicon solar cells. And I, I, 
I think it was interesting. I, I heard a, a question or, or concern from the Pareto survey that said, well, is this relevant to field deployed modules? Um, and, and that's certainly an open question. Uh, from the IEA report of review of failure, failures for PV modules, uh, that was one of the few identified as a potential long-term wear-out mechanism. So it may take a, a long time to manifest, but when it does, it, it could be uh, pretty catastrophic and sort of an end-of-life failure. Uh, and there is some evidence that this does occur in the field. Uh, there's some work by Tanahashi, who's sort of uh, co collected some of this field data, and, and we're seeing at least patterns that, that resemble what we might see in damp heat. So I, I think there is a correlation there, um, but, but we certainly do need to be uh, cautious with, with what we're doing in chamber testing. So if you go to the next slide, what we typically see is ex during extended damp heat, there's sort of an inflection point in the, the performance that starts somewhere between 1,500 and, and 3,000 hours. And so this work by, by Cole sort of shows a, uh, for different manufacturers, where that inflection point is and, and how drastic that, that change in performance can be. And so we've identified this as metallization corrosion as the, the main driver for this degradation. And, and the signature within EL is what's shown on the bottom right there, where the darkening starts at the edges of the cell and through continued exposure sort of works its way in. And again, um, there's this concern about, well, if we start going to things like in this paper, 5,000 hours, how representative is that? And, and I certainly understand that that's a, a concern. And I think we're changing the accelerated exposure um, condition to, to maybe address some of those concerns moving forward. But I do think it's worth understanding the mechanisms behind these corrosions so that um, we don't inadvertently induce these failures in the field. So if you go to the next slide, the, the mechanism as uh, Meng Hong pointed out, uh, really involves a multi-step process. The, the first being the hydrolysis of the EVA itself and the formation of acetic acid. That acetic acid then corrodes the metallization, which eventually increases the series resistance of the cell and leads to power loss. And so this was uh, initially confirmed by uh, work by Pike where they saw um, some needle-like uh, crystallites after extended damp heat, and they were able to identify that this was in fact lead acetate. So, so some interaction between the lead within the metallization and the acetic acid uh, was, was corroding away those metal fingers. And so if you go to the next slide, there's some uh, more recent work that's sort of showing the, the exact mechanism there. So what happens is this, this lead that's mainly within the glass layer, that uh, interfacial layer between the metal grid line and the silicon is really dissolving within the acetic acid. And so that leads to the formation of a, a void between the, the silicon or the, the silicon and the metallization. And that void grows over time and you can sort of see um, the, the results on the SEM image on the right where that, that void exists. So that creates you know, an, an increase in the effective contact resistivity of those contacts and, and increases the cell series resistance. So if you go to the next slide, so the, the question is why is this relevant to PERC? And I think uh, we need to be concerned when we're moving to PERC technologies, we're seeing new firing profiles and potentially new chemistries within the paste themselves, particularly on the rear side as we move to bifacial. Uh, there, there could be some, some new chemistries, and we want to make sure we're not creating new degradation pathways. So to, to demonstrate that point, I, I sort of highlight a couple different works that we've seen. Uh, on the, the right in green, we sort of see copper-coated contacts. So that, that may not be relevant to PERC or, or even commercial uh, production in general, but it is interesting because 
what they found is there's degradation pathways that don't involve acetic acid anymore. So even with a, a PoE encapsulant, we're still seeing the same degradation of those copper cons. Um, so uh, there's other work that sort of shows maybe we're not seeing the same pattern of metallization corrosion occurring at the edges of the cells and moving inward. And, and in fact, starting at the bus bars and moving outward. So maybe there's some, some material there, whether it's solder flux or, or maybe even galvanic corrosion occurring uh, in the metallization. So as we move forward with PERC and, and the chemistries of these metallizations change, we need to make sure we're qualifying those materials and not inadvertently creating new degradation pathways. If we go to the next slide. So another concern that, that's often referred to PERC cells is, is cell fracture. I, I think this is a common concern across all silicon technologies, but I, I think the, the interesting point or, or the reason why this is a concern for PERC is because there's some new laser processing to, to create these local back contacts so to, to etch through the, the dielectric and, and create contact at the rear surface. And so as a, um, there was some work that sort of shows that different laser processing techniques, in this case, it was applied to forming half cells from full cells. You, you can have very different results mechanical properties of the cell. So the, the chart you're seeing on the right, it, higher up on that chart means that there's a higher stress required to create fracture, and lower on that chart means it's a, a lower stress required to create fracture. So there was two processes used, thermal laser, which was a, a very clean laser process, and, and that in fact increased the, the fracture strength of the material Whereas if you use a, a, a less clean laser scribe and cleave method, you can actually reduce the fracture strength. And so I think that the concern here is as we're using these laser processing steps on the rear side of the device, we need to make sure that we're not inducing uh, that will eventually propagate with the application of a mechanical load. So the final degradation mechanism that I wanted to discuss was uh, potential induced degradation. And so specifically related to PERC cells, uh, there's a, a polarization type of degradation that has been observed. And so what happens here is, as we have a negative polarity, so a high negative potential of the cells with respect to the frame, we can actually drive positive ions towards the rear surface passivation. And the way aluminum oxide uh, provides its passivation properties is through what's called field effect passivation. And it does this with a, with a negative fixed charge. So it, it actually repels carriers away from that interface. And so as we sort of pump positive ions towards that interface, we can degrade the, the, the passivation properties of that aluminum oxide. And so this is, a, this is one mechanism that does show there's, there's a potential pathway for passivation layer degradation. Um, and, and so we really need to be looking at this and, and seeing if it's relevant to field exposure. So I, I think this, th there's evidence that this is recoverable under light exposure. So, um, so I think it's an open question as to whether this can occur in the field but it certainly does occur in, in chamber testing. And so, so this is one potential mechanism for passivation layer degradation. So I, from here, I'll pass it over to Jean Nicolas, who will talk about the, I think the bigger issue that, that most of us are concerned about, which is LETID. Yes, as, uh, as the Pareto revealed, uh, everyone main concern is currently on the LETID, which stands for Light and Elevated Temperature induced Degradation. On this slide, I want first to clarify a bit what we put behind this acronym. 
and the difference between uh, LID and LTID degradation modes. Uh, in terms of kinetics, first, the LID is a phenomenon which is happening very fast, usually in less than uh, one morph in the, in the field, the um, degradation can uh, entirely happen. By opposition, the LTID has been showing slower degradation kinetics, and depending on uh, your environment condition, it can take uh, as much as one to three years to develop to the higher degradation and even longer to, to recover. In terms of mechanism, the LID has uh, been studied very extensively in the last 10 years, and the mechanism is very well known now, being entirely related to boron oxygen. But on the other hand, for LTID, there are still many assumptions and theories, and the mechanism has not been fully discovered. Both have been uh, have been the most most have been appearing um, more in PERC than in non-PERC cells, uh, particularly LHID. So PERC has been showing more sensitivity to the LHID degradation mode, um, while for LID, mono was the main uh, most sensitive because the defect was mainly bulk related. Usually on the bottom, you can see a representative EL of a LTID sensitive module. After full degradation, there will be a patchwork of cells, the cell being most affected, mostly affected being almost dark. Next slide. Now in terms of mechanisms, so the last three years have been, uh, uh, many institutes have reported uh, research on the, on the mechanism of LTID. The phenomenon was first discovered and presented by Harwa Q cells in 2015. Harwa observed that the mechanism is not sensitive to the interstitial oxygen concentration, but related to the break eight. They also shown that the mechanism is independent of the church of specification layer technology. And we concluded that the, this is also a bulk degradation behavior. Next slide. Following on the research from Hanwha, Fronhofer also performed their own study, and mainly they came, they came up with the conclusion that the mechanism was very homogeneous for the, for the full cells, and potentially they, they pointed out this was LHID was due to atomic point defect dissolving the, in the crystal structure. Next slide, please. The last contribution in the research of LHID has been done by UNSW in the last two years. So UNSW actually came up with a, a new name for the phenomenon, we call it HID for hydrogen induced degradation, as they have shown that the degradation um, after dark annealing uh, are most probably linked to the hydrogen diffusion, which plays a part in the activation of the defect the passivating of the defect and then the recombination of the active complex. Next slide, please. So UNSW, the last, the last uh, report released by UNSW was in 2018. So we presented a full model for the LETID, which involved a four state model. One of the key points is uh, the hydrogen uh, distributed through the different cell structure and create, uh, act as a defect precursor. Um, so they show that after doing many cycles of uh, degradation, recovery, and dark annealing, the phenomena is, the extent of the degradation is probably decreasing. So what how we came with this four state model, they, need, they showed that the defect precursor is present in a, in a reservoir. So, um, that's currently the most uh, accomplished theory, but uh, still more, more work is needed to, to prove it further. Next slide. So even if the, yeah, a, few, a few I like to take back on the LIT phenomenon. First of all, this is a defect, which is not only present in multicrystalline, but also have been shown to, to appear in PERC mono and or even uh, other type of high efficiency cells. At the same time, even if now the mechanism is not entirely fully known, there are already, the industry already has a mitigation method and the industry along with the, the IEC and other research institutes have been working very closely and actively 
to develop a new testing standard for LHID. Currently, the test method has been proposed as a, uh, within the IC61215, and the draft is a round robin is going on between different partners to evaluate the test method. Next slide, please. At CSI, we have a uh, rock and puck multi-crystallines in many years and came up with our own mitigation method. So in order to mitigate LTID, need need uh, is a need to have a control through the complete supply chain. So starting with the ingots process, in particular the ingots recipe, how many um, different, different sources of silicon to be used and in which um, percentage, and the control of the dopant process for the ingots uh, growing. These are key, key control, the first step of key control for, for uh, mitigate LTID. It's, uh, this is followed by a cartization method on the wafer level, photoluminescence, to ensure this step is the uh, ingot growing step complied to the basic requirement. The next important step is on the cell processing. Many institutes, in particular in SW, have shown that in order to control the LTID, there is a need to develop new, um, up upgrade the firing process. So the recipe on the firing process is also one of the most critical steps on the cell level, and not only the regeneration process. When you have a full control on the firing, where you have established the right firing, metallization firing recipe, then the last step is using an advanced handling, handling or regeneration process. Current induced regeneration has been the most efficient due to its cost effectiveness, and it allows us to do uh, large volume sampling. So we usually sample about 0.08% um, of the scale, which are going through a, a CID or current induced degradation process to control uh, the degradation batch by batch. And this allows very fast reaction and feedback to the cell process. Finally, on the last stage, mod module side also uh, require testing. So on top of the standard cell testing, there is also cell CID current energy degradation done at the module level, coupled with LID on sh in short outdoor testing and long-term outdoor testing. So this shows that the proper LID mitigation require a given knowledge at each different process step from the ingots to the cell. And there are, no, no, there is an industry already has knowledge to implement this. Thank you, next slide. Uh, so next we'll be discussing some specific results uh, done within this study through damp heat. Uh, first, Eric is going to talk very briefly about some full module damp heat studies we've done, and then I will take over talking about uh, the mini modules you've run. Yeah, so I, I think we've done some uh, module level extended damp heat um, uh, with the partners at Canadian Solar and, and others, and we have identified actually unique uh, corrosion mechanisms between what we're seeing in ALBSF and PERC technology. So we're seeing the, the same trend of, of uh, an inflection point out near 2,000 hours that correlates with an increase in series resistance uh, and a drop in power. But this, uh, the patterns that we're seeing within the electroluminescent signal are, are, are unique and, and different. And so I think you know, as we're studying these modules, we'll, we'll do further investigations and microscopic studies to try to understand what those mechanisms are. But, but this was sort of a, a nice motivation for why we're looking at these mini modules uh, of different packaging and different technologies and exposing them to damp heat. Uh, and, and our hope is to identify these unique degradation pathways and really try and understand what's happening as we change materials uh, and, and cell devices. So next slide. So then um, from there into the mini module study that was done here, uh, this was a total of 60 mini modules that were put under damp heat exposure through 2,500 hours. Uh, there, were there were some concerns from the Pareto survey about damp heat. 
uh, and I have some information on that a bit further down when we do some cross-correlation to outdoor results. Um, but for the variations within these mini-modules, we have two cell variations. There is multicrystalline ALBSF, shown here in the Neil image, and then monocrystalline uh, monofacial PERC, uh, shown here in this image. Um, and then we had EVA and TOE encapsulants. These were both the UV cutoff. Uh, at this point, we have not done the complete um, exposure of white encapsulants yet, but those are coming next. And then we were doing a comparison between three back sheets that show low, medium, and high water vapor transfer rates. Uh, at each step of 500 hours, IV curves were taken at both the mini module level and the individual cell level. And we also got Sintin, Sun's USC, and EL images at low and high current for all of these. So if we look at linear max power modeling from the IV curves here, uh, what we can see is uh, a very clear difference between max power in the ALBSF and PERP mini modules, which is uh, certainly expected. And we can see some specifics down here if we look at the percent loss per thousand hours, uh, this is generally higher than what you would expect in damp heat. Um, and it's, it even gets higher uh, going down to the cell level. So this would suggest that there are some changes going on external to the cells themselves, uh, which we will address in a little bit. Um, but beyond this, we're also looking at uh, nonlinear degradation. The, the case we look at mostly is piecewise linear, um, where you have uh, one linear section followed by a second linear section here. And if we, if we pay attention to the adjusted our square values moving forward, we can see that when we do uh, piecewise linear modeling of the power, the adjusted our squares really do not have any significant change associated with them, meaning that these breakpoints don't give us any new information uh, captured in this trend that is not already captured in the linear here. So what we're seeing with these is that um, they are not degrading piecewise, it's basically just a mostly linear drop in power as these move forward in JP. Um, if we look at some of the splits by packaging material here, this is cell level power loss between all of these. Uh, we don't see too many significant differences in performance here. The main ones being that ALBSF seems a bit more sensitive to the material, where KPF shows better performance than the other back sheets, and then POE uh, shows a better performance there between all of these. Um, and again, we're seeing the proportionally higher percentage loss at the cell level as opposed to the module level. So if we look at um, some ZOC loss mechanisms, mechanisms, which can help us understand specifically what our power is being lost to or the changes within the modules that are occurring, we can see that series loss is by far the most dominant um, uh, effect on the cell level power change. Um, with current loss being the second highest and then recombination loss being nearly zero in this case. Um, and given that we're seeing the larger, uh, larger proportional decreases as you go down scale to the individual cells, and uh, this is mostly dominated by series loss, this suggests that we're actually seeing some degradation in the leads themselves, which is more proportional uh, or proportionally higher at low levels or low power levels uh, as opposed to if these were on full size modules where it'd be less overall. So um, future, uh, future accelerated exposures will be shielding these a bit better, hopefully to reduce the external losses and keep everything within the cells themselves. Um, if, we can, uh, if we jump straight into outdoor exposure results, uh, we always want to do cross correlation between outdoor data we've obtained to accelerated exposures because the accelerated exposures are only useful if they can give you information as to what is going to occur outdoors for these modules. Um, in this case, we're looking at some outdoor stepwise data obtained by uh, CSI, and this was done in their outdoor measuring facility. Um, these are the longest term outdoor exposures we have so far in this project, and it is, um, these are a series of 10 modules, both for PERC and LBSF, that are exposed outside and taken indoors uh, intermittently for IV sweeps. And what we can see here is uh, a pretty clear change in the trend here after the first measurement, where there's a sharp drop in power loss followed by a much more stable region due to the light induced degradation. Um, if we do similar modeling to these that we did with the, uh, with the mini modules, we can see that we see much higher adjusted our squared trends going from 
linear to piecewise linear modeling indicating that we are capturing more information. Uh, not surprisingly, the change point occurs right here after the first test uh, when the cell ID has occurred. Um, so if we cross-correlate these and we scale the indoor models to the outdoor models, in this case, we're not using the mini modules, we're using damp heat down on full size modules because they're more similar to the ones outside. Um, what we can see is that between the actual predicted power along this line, we really aren't capturing this trend well if we scale module, uh, models from damp heat to outdoor data because the damp heat does not have this initial drop due to LID. Uh, and this tells us that any accelerated exposure that does not include light exposure is uh, going to have difficulty correlating to outdoor data directly. And so this has influenced how we plan uh, the next round of exposure we're going to be doing, which is going to be modified damp heat at a slightly lower temperature uh, with the introduction of full spectrum exposure to that. In addition to the stepwise data, we're also collecting time series data, both IV and PMP in this case. And these are three of the modules we have set up at our sun farm. Uh, at Case Western Reserve University. There's also a lot of uh, modules set up at Canadian Solar that are going for testing. Um, but these have been installed fairly recently, so we don't have a long time series of these. Generally with time series data, we'd like to have a year so we can observe any overall seasonality uh, that we're seeing from these. But we hope to start including these uh, within the next round of exposures. And with that, we'll be moving into the next steps of the project. Great. So just to overview what we'll be doing in the second half of this project, the next 18 months, again, we're looking at the most commercially viable options uh, for PERC mini modules and full-size modules. So uh, in the current year, we're looking at multicrystalline, bifacial, and half cells in our mini modules. And so over here, you can see some white light and EL images of the, the current round of mini modules that are going into accelerated tests. And so you can see that we have multicrystalline ALBSF and bifacial PERC cells, uh, as well as monofacial, uh, sorry, monocrystalline bifacial PERC cells. We're looking at different variations of encapsulants, so transparent encapsulants on the front side of the cell and white and UV cutoff behind the cell. And these are, um, we're continuing our outdoor field studies with time series IV and PMP uh, for both full size and mini modules and it, conducting new accelerated tests, uh, which will now include multi-factor exposures. Uh, so uh, light in addition to damp heat or thermal cycling and uh, performing stepwise evaluations on those. And the stepwise evaluations will then include the lab-based uh, microscopy and module level um, evaluations, as well as some cell and materials level evaluations. Um, and we're also working on some field deployable data analytics um, for outdoor time series data. So we want to thank everyone for attending this webinar today. We do welcome your feedback, questions, and suggestions, both on the webinar and on the project in general. And please contact us for a copy of the slides uh, or a recording of the webinar. And you can contact me here, jennifer.braid at case.edu.